Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kelsey. I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History and a recent graduate of Cambridge University. So at university I studied classics, so ancient history at undergraduate level and then a masters in Egyptology. So I've started doing a series where I kind of look at ancient historical films and talk about their historical inspiration and where they went a little bit wrong. If you're interested in this kind of content, don't forget to check out all of my socials, and if you do like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Today's video is the third in the series, so don't forget to go check out my last two where I looked at The Mummy and Troy. Today I'm going to be talking about the 2009 movie called Agora, and this stars Rachel Weisz and Oscar Isaac. Despite its amazing cast and its brilliant concept, it hasn't been a very popular film and I personally hadn't really heard of it until recently. But having now watched it, I highly recommend it. So I'm going to give you a little synopsis so you know whether you want to go watch it or not and then play spoiler warnings when I'm going to give away any major plot points. At its core, the movie explores the key themes of the rise of Christianity, the role of women in Christianity and the Roman Empire generally, Roman politics and astronomy. I would then generally class it as a ancient historical drama with hints of romance. I'm now going to try my very best to just give a very brief summary of the plot and I'm going to give you the spoiler warning of when it's getting towards the end of the movie or crucial points that are going to kind of ruin your viewing experience. It's set in the 4th century CE in Alexandria, so Roman Egypt. During this period it discusses the fact that Christianity has now become legalised and is becoming a very popular religion. Generally, it focuses on feuds between paganism and Christianity. The principal character is a woman named Hypatia, and she is a Greek philosopher and astronomer, played by Rachel Weisz. We primarily see her as a teacher, and we see her teaching astronomy to many men, such as one of our other principal characters, Orestes, and this is the character played by Oscar Isaac. We then also focus on her slave named Darvus, and if you're going to pronounce it properly, it's Darwus, but throughout the whole film, they obviously pronounce it like how we would in English rather than the Latin. But that's fine, we ignore that. We quickly realise that the character of Orestes has fallen in love with Hypatia, and he makes many proposals to her, which she rejects in some pretty amazing styles. Ultimately, she states that she is just committed to her work. She doesn't care about having a man in her life. She cares about astronomy. While this is happening with our principal characters, we see the tensions continue to rise between the Christians and the pagans, with a revolt starting to take place. During this revolt, the Christians eventually take over the building called the Serapium, and this is kind of an extension of the Library of Alexandria, so it's where a lot of her philosophy and astronomy work is being stored. So as they start to invade, you see a bunch of them trying to collect as many scrolls as possible to save as much information as they can. During this, her slave Darvis actually abandons them and joins the Christians. Once the pagans escape this kind of revolt, we then skip 20 years into the future and we see Orestes has taken the role of the Roman prefect of Egypt. We also begin to appreciate the rising popularity of Christianity as Orestes has had to convert to this religion to kind of keep his role and prominent position within Roman politics. Despite converting and Hypatia remaining loyal to her religion of astronomy rather than Christianity, they still remain very close friends and he actually consults with her for a lot of his politics. However, the leaders of the Christian religion at this time are not happy with this and they kind of manipulate the Bible to state that women shouldn't be having these roles and they make it so that he has to publicly denounce her role or she's going to get punished. We then have this scene where Orestes goes to Hypatia and explains what's happening and says that he can offer her protection as his husband and so on, but she remains committed to astronomy. Because of this decision, the Christians hound her and they're ultimately planning to stone her to death. However, her slave Darvus comes back and he suffocates her so that she doesn't have to suffer this fate. And that's how the film ends. It's Obviously not a happy ending, but it's a very, very good film with amazing acting and I'm excited to tell you it is surprisingly accurate. 
And that's kind of one of the reasons why I enjoyed the film so much, because it managed to strike this perfect balance between being true to the historical fact, while still making a very dramatised and entertaining film. So, I'm going to try my best to work my way through the film and tell you what is historical fact and what is historically exaggerated. Let's start with the date. So the film starts in 391 CE in Alexandria. In starting at this point in time, it tells us that this is during the rise of Christianity, and that is correct. So in 313 CE, we have the Edict of Milan being created by the Emperor Constantine. And what this edict does is legalise all religions within the Roman Empire. So not specifically Christianity, but you can follow any faith. This meant that paganism and other things like Judaism continued to flourish and grow. However, in 380 CE, we have a new edict. This is the Edict of Thessalonica, created by the Emperor Theodosius. And what this did was make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. When we consider that this edict is happening in 380 CE and our film is set in 391 CE, it makes sense because across such a large empire, nothing is going to be instant and change of opinions is going to be a slow process. So in summary, the dating is very accurate and makes sense. The key event to pinpoint it to this year is also the destruction of the Serapium or Serapium. And this again does happen in 391 CE. So in summary, the dating is perfect. The start of the film also mentions the Lighthouse of Alexandria and the Library of Alexandria. And again, these are very real pieces of architecture from Roman Egypt. In fact, the Lighthouse was one of the seven wonders of the world. Unfortunately, they do not remain to us today. But we know through historical accounts that they did exist, and we can kind of guess a little bit about what they looked like. The film also highlights the fact that this area was renowned for its philosophy at the time and second only to Athens. Again, this is true, especially the Library of Alexandria. This was an important institution for the development of intellect at the time. And the Serapium did actually serve its role as a kind of offshoot to the Library of Alexandria, so it makes sense that we see these characters do a lot of their work here. Obviously, within the film, we see the destruction of the Serapium, and this is completely justified because some accounts do say that it's destroyed by the Christians, but there are general conflicting ideas depending on which source you're looking at, but it was ultimately destroyed. Next, I'm really excited to discuss the character of Hypatia because she is a real person. And if you've seen the film, her character is amazing. She's so powerful, so independent, and she existed. Obviously, if you're not familiar with this period in history, to consider the fact that a woman could hold this kind of powerful role at this point in time is amazing. Yeah, I'm just going to preface this with the fact that every film is going to dramatise some elements, especially because we're not going to know every detail about an ancient historical figure's life. So they have to fill in the blanks somehow. You're not going to know how they acted as a person, what they really thought and did. So it's completely justified when they do add elements of fiction to these characters. The real Hypatia lived from around 350 to 415 CE, placing it at the right kind of time period. Much like the film, she was a Greek who lived in Alexandria, and she was a very real philosopher and astronomer. She's also one of the first female mathematicians that we have a considerable amount of information about. However, she's not the first. She was also taught by a female figure called Pandrosion. Like the film, she is the daughter of Theon of Alexandria. She is also a Neoplatonist, like they depict her in the film. What's quite cool is that they even get the costume accurate, because he is noted for having worn a tribon and walking through the streets giving impromptu lectures. However, as I discussed, the film really focuses on her as an astronomer, and it kind of overplays this, because she was one, but she was more a philosopher than an astronomer. That's what she really focused on. In the film, they also over-exaggerate her opinions towards Christianity. In the film, she's really depicted as an atheist. However, in reality, she is pretty tolerant towards all views, and she actually had a good relationship with the Christian population for much of her life. Unfortunately, there is one big error within the film, which is 
kind of one of its main plot points and this is the idea that Hypatia is the woman behind the heliocentric model of the solar system. And this is built on the idea that she kind of proves Aristarchus's original theory on it. However, we now don't have any evidence that this is ever something that she even studied or looked into, and it obviously existed before her. So yeah, unfortunately it's a bit weird that the film decided to completely fictionalise that bit because there's a lot of other work that she did which still even remains to us today that they could have focused on, but I guess some of it would have been a little bit more hard to communicate in simple terms within a short film, so they picked the heliocentric model as something that we all understand today. Orestes, played by Oscar Isaac, again is a real person, which is so exciting. And he was actually a student of Hypatia, he studied under her, which I think is really cool. He did then also come to power as the Prefect of Alexandria in 415 CE, so completely accurate. We then also have evidence of the fact that he did used to consult with her and go to her for advice in political matters. We then also have evidence to suggest that it was his relationship with Hypatia that turned the Christians against their cause and ultimately led to her death. However, I personally couldn't find evidence of this kind of romance that they build between the two characters. But again, you have to think, is that something you would find in historical record? So it's not completely unlikely that it would have happened, and then obviously within the film it's only on his side. So it makes sense that it wouldn't be something recorded in history, but could have happened. Aside from the slave Darvis, who is a fictionalised character, most of the other main characters then are also real historical figures. For example, the Bishop of Cyrene, called Cynesius, was a real person, he was the bishop, and, like the film, he studied under Hypatia. The character Theophilus was also the Bishop of Alexandria, and was a key figure in the demise of Hypatia. In the film, we see a moment where Oscar Isaac's character, Oresti, declares his love publicly to Hypatia. It's a very awkward and cringy scene, but he's in this theatre and he plays an instrument to kind of seduce and show his love for her. It obviously doesn't go well, but there is a lot of historical fact in this act. We don't have any evidence for the act itself, but the scene in which it is happening is very real. So to start off with, the amphitheatre that we see is obviously a very real ancient Greek and Roman thing that they bring over to Egypt's Alexandria. You also see the audience applauding with these kind of clapper mechanism and this is a real thing, we have actual artefacts for this. You also see the actors performing in these masks and again that's a very real thing brought over from ancient Greece because you would kind of put on a different mask to show a different character or emotion. And the fact that it's all played by men, again, a very real thing. Finally, the instrument he plays, which is kind of this, like, too fluted thing, is an aulos. And this, again, is a very real instrument that we have from ancient Greece. After this scene, the tensions between the pagan and Christian community continue to amplify. In doing so, they really highlight the harsh treatment that the Christian population has received. So let's talk about this relationship between the two religions a little bit and see how accurate it is. The pagans and paganism refers to any kind of polytheistic religion during the Roman Empire. This is other than Judaism. The harsh treatment of the Christian population was a very real issue at the beginning of the Roman Empire. For example, in one scene they talk about how the Christians were fed to lions in the circuses. And unfortunately, this is true. Writers like Tacitus talk about how the Christians were being left in these amphitheatres to fight and battle with these exotic creatures and were ultimately eaten. However, the amount that this actually happens is a little bit over-exaggerated. It was a very rare punishment that was more symbolic to show that the Christians were on a similar level to other criminals receiving this punishment. Because to the Romans, the Christians were guilty of many crimes. It was obviously sacrilegious to go against the Roman gods. They accused them of practicing magic and of high treason. 
So we've established that the Christian religion did rise in popularity and that they did ultimately come to power. But what about the end of the film? The Christian leaders criticise the role of women and basically say that somebody as powerful as Hypatia should not exist and that this action in itself is blasphemous. They also accuse her of witchcraft. They hint at the fact that she's being accused of this because of her paganism or lack of Christian values. So we know that obviously the Christians did come to power as they say in the film, but what about the end of the film and the death of Hypatia? How accurate is this? Unfortunately, this is pretty much how Hypatia dies and the film actually makes it seem nicer than what we have evidence for. Firstly, the film shows this to be more religiously motivated and it's the fact that she is perhaps still a pagan or just not practicing Christianity that they turn against her. In reality, we think it's a lot more politically motivated and that it was this relationship between Orestes and Hypatia that was stopping the prefect from reconciling with the Christian leaders. So simply, they saw her as an object that was in the way of their rise to power. In the film, we see her refusing any guards to accompany her home from her discussion with Orestes and this is when she's attacked by a Christian mob. Reality is only slightly different because she's just riding home in a carriage. But like the film, she is stopped, she is stripped of all her clothes and brought into a nearby building. And in the film they say that they're going to stone her to death. In reality this is true, they used bits of roof tiles or ostraca or just stones. Some accounts then also add that they gouged her eyes out. They then also tore her body apart piece by piece before finally setting her remains on fire in the city. So obviously this differs slightly from the film where we see her slave Darvis kind of saving her from this gory death as he sneaks in and they agree that she's going to be suffocated to avoid it. So it's actually kind of evidence where you see the film being less dramatic than reality. Which is pretty rare. Obviously the film then finishes with her death so we don't get to see the real aftermath and this is kind of what reveals the fact that it wasn't so much religiously motivated but for political power. After her death most of the Christian population is not happy and she becomes worshipped as a martyr of philosophy and eventually a symbol of Christian virtue. Some scholars even believe that she was actually the basis for the myth of St. Catherine of Alexandria. And that is everything. Obviously I couldn't cover all of the film and there's so many different aspects we can look at because we can look at their costumes and the architecture, but I think that's all we can fit in today. So if there is anything more you want me to talk about, just comment it down below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye!